All right, we're going to get started right now. Um, first of all, thank you everybody for coming to the Alternative Careers panel. So the goal of this panel is for us to interact with a group of speakers who have done so many things with their lives um, outside of academic medicine. I feel like most of us, we enter an MD-PhD program, we're told that academic medicine is the way to go. Um, and all of the mentors around us are from academic medicine and rarely do we get a chance to actually meet and interact with somebody who has gone outside of it. Um, so the three speakers we have today are Dr. Daryl Dykes, Dr. Anna Fisher, and Dr. Andrew Chan. I'm going to give them a really quick introduction first um, before we open up the panel for questioning. If you have questions, please approach the microphone at the center of the room and line up. All right, let's get started. So Dr. Dykes' training record includes an orthopedic surgery residency at the University of Minnesota. He got his MD-PhD at SUNY Upstate and his JD. <laughs> Um, at the William Mitchell College of Law. Um, he also served in the Marine Corps for a short time to put himself through medical school. Um, in addition to being a managing partner of the Medical and Surgical Spinal Consultants of Minnesota right now, he's also served on the House of Committee on Energy and Commerce at the FDA. So next over we have Dr. Anna Fisher. She earned her master's researching x-ray crystallography and metallocarbonanes and has an MD from UCLA. After medical school, she specialized in emergency medicine and practiced for a few years be jo before joining NASA in 1978. So while at NASA, Dr. Fisher flew on Space Shuttle Discovery on STS-51A and logged a total of 192 hours in space. On her return, she served as the chief of the space station branch of the astronaut office, overseeing many other astronauts and support engineers, as well as spacecraft communicator for crews on the space shuttle, as well as the International Space Station. And last but not least, um, we have Dr. Andrew Chan. His training record includes an MD-PhD from the Washington University School of Medicine, um, as well as his residency and faculty positions at UCSF. Currently, though, he is the Senior Vice President of Research Biology at Genentech and oversees active research on T-cell receptor internalization in childhood asthma. So now I'm just going to have the panelists tell us a little bit more about their career trajectory, how they ended up in the careers that they have chosen, um, and yeah. Great. Well, uh, is this on? Oh. Th uh, it's a pleasure to be here today, and uh, the most exciting thing that I'm going to take away is I get to go home and tell my family that I got to sit next to a real space cadet. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, you know, I was, I was interested that this panel was called Work-Life Balance because I really, in thinking about this, have recognized that I don't know very much about that. And it was kind of my uh, attempt at achieving work-life balance that has kind of led to this uh, sort of really non-traditional crazy pathway of a career that I've had. Uh, so as you heard, I started out in a medical scientist training program at Syracuse and uh, had my basic research in molecular biology and uh, biophysics. And I was doing very, uh, you know, heavy basic science uh, intensive research um, had every intention of uh, academic, traditional academic career, and then went on to do my orthopedic residency. Uh, got started uh, in basic uh, research uh, in orthopedics and bone regeneration and those you know typical kind of things someone with my background would do. Uh, eventually became the director of research at my institution. And kind of one thing led to another, really. Um, and I became the managing partner of the practice. And I'm not unique uh, in discovering that as we you know, start to take more leadership roles in medicine, our traditional medical and academic training does not prepare you uh, to be a executive, to be a leader, to be a CEO, to worry about HR issues and personnel and uh, tax and finance and all these other issues. So as um, a means to kind of understand that a little bit more, I actually got involved with a program in the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons called the Leadership Fellows Program. And what that program does is identify young orthopedists and try to expose them through a mentorship experience, uh, didactic uh, coursework that we actually took here, uh, at Northwestern University uh, in an MBA type program uh, and then 
incorporating our activities inside the academy to do leadership type work on committees and so forth. So anyway, uh, working on this leadership fellows program, um, I got more interested in policy issues. In fact, one of the components of that program is we would spend time in Washington, D.C., actually lobbying Congress and uh, learning about you know, regulatory and le legislative issues that uh, affected health care and, and science. Um, and, and that really just triggered a, a fascination for me. So long story short, to, to fast forward, uh, about four years after my experience on the Leadership Fellows Program, uh, I was selected to chair that program and actually spent four years mentoring other orthopedic surgeons who were going through this, this process. And it was really transformative for me. Um, in that experience, and some of you might, might not remember this, but there was something called the SGR, the Sustainable Growth Rate. And this was a, a tool that Congress used to try to address the rapidly rising costs in healthcare. And the bottom line is every single year, doctors were faced with these really draconian cuts in Medicare reimbursement. So we would go to Washington and lobby year after year after year for a fix to this system. Ultimately, uh, Congress did fix that with uh, a bill called MACRA in 2015, the uh, Medicare and CHIP Reauthorization Act. And all of these factors, so this, this lack of experience uh, as an uh, executive in a, in a medical practice, this congressional experience, um, dealing with uh, uh, legal and regulatory uh, issues in my own practice stimulated me to pursue a law degree. Um, so I actually went to law school, uh, finished law school, and got uh, more excited about these kinds of things, and then finally uh, applied for and, and was selected for what's uh, called a Robert Wood Johnson Health Policy Fellowship. Uh, the Robert Wood Johnson Health Policy Fellowship takes uh, practicing healthcare professionals and embeds them in the Washington regulatory and legislative process uh, to actually learn more about those issues, but then actually contribute as a, as a real world in the trenches provider to sort of help shape and form legislative policy. My particular uh, assignment was on the uh, House of Representatives uh, Committee on Energy and Commerce. Doesn't sound like it has much to do with healthcare. But actually, the Energy and Commerce Committee uh, controls more federal health care than any other committee in Congress, including NIH, FDA, CDC, uh, basically every, all of all federal health care. Um, and so I spent a year and a half uh, doing that and had some wonderful experiences that I'll tell you about later, probably during the question and answer session, and then ultimately transitioned from there to uh, work as an ongoing consultant with the Food and Drug Administration. So uh, the bottom line is it was that, uh, that attempt at achieving work-life balance that uh, I, I sought this outside activity through the academy, let's learn some more leadership kind of things, and ultimately it just ended up in a lot more work for me. So. <laughs> wow, that's uh, very motivating for me <laughs> with um, the advent of commercial uh, space um, things going on right now. I keep thinking about going back to law school because I think there's a whole new area of law that's going to develop, but I don't think I want to work that hard <laughs> at this stage of my life. Um, yeah, I was also going to uh, add just uh, for, some, for some of the young women in the audience, um, I was also the first mom to go into space. My, uh, my daughter says I, <laughs> my daughter says I owe it all to her. So. <laughs> Um, so I'll just give you a little bit of background and then uh, of how I got where I was. Um, my career, again, uh, also followed a non-traditional path, um, and I kind of evolved. Uh, I'll backtrack a little and say my father was in the military. So when we settled in San Pedro, California, eighth grade was my 13th school. So um, I learned to travel and adapt to new situations pretty quickly. I was always good at math and science and um, knew that I was not going to be someone who excelled at drama or music or any of those other things. So I knew that from a very young age that math and science was going to be the thing that I wanted to pursue. But I wasn't 100% sure exactly how I wanted to do that. Um, 
as I uh, g got older and I went to UCLA, I was the first person in my family uh, to go to college. And um, I, again, I started out in math, but quickly thought, you know, this isn't quite for me. And I, um, I don't know if many of you had this kind of pathway. Um, a lot of my friends were in chemistry and I was around a lot of people studying it. And I really liked it. And the chemistry department at UCLA, way back, you know, this is like I graduated with my bachelor's in uh, 71. Um, they were very supportive of, of women in, in that career field. So I started out in chemistry then and um, got an NSF undergraduate research fellowship and uh, for two, uh, the summers after my third and, and my senior year. And I loved chemistry. That's when I did some of the research that was mentioned in the introduction. Um, but I watched my research advisor spend so much of his time writing grant proposals. And I realized that that was probably not what I was going to want to do. Um, I, I forgot one thing, and that is when my father was stationed at Fort Campbell, Kentucky when I was 12 years old, um, I listened to Al Shepard's uh, suborbital flight, the first American to go into space. And at that moment, I knew that's what I wanted to do. That seed was planted back then, but I didn't know how to achieve that goal. You know, the, the only astronauts at that point were all male, and they were all test pilots. And for whatever reason, it never even occurred to me to join the military and become a pilot. But that seed was planted. But as I was at UCLA making what I would call real career decisions. Um, there weren't a lot of astronauts around still, and that didn't seem like a very real option. But as I decided that um, chemistry probably was not the area that I wanted to pursue, I made a very late decision to go to medical school because I decided it was a great combination of science and working with people. And way in the back of my head that I never admitted to anybody, I thought, well, maybe there'll be a space station someday and I could be a doctor on a space station. Um, but I wasn't real optimistic about that. Uh, so anyway, I, I went in, um, I made my decision to go to medical school very late and was only on the waiting list the first year I applied. So I spent a year uh, in the chemistry uh, pr uh, program, was accepted on the PhD program there and then was accepted the following year at, to UCLA Medical School um, on the MD-PhD program, like many of you in the audience are probably doing. So then I started medical school, and as many of you also probably realize, once you get going on your medical degree, for me, it was a very, uh, it, it was just hard. The way they do it at UCLA is you do your first two years, and then you do your research. And I just didn't want to stop. I didn't want all my friends to leave me behind. And I figured that um, I would see what would happen, and I would go back and do that later. Well, long story short, I graduate. I actually was um, thinking very seriously of going into surgery and was accepted into the surgery department um, at Harbor General, which is a UCLA-affiliated hospital. Um, was actually told by the chairman of the department that women didn't belong in surgery but they accepted me. <laughs> it was kind of strange. But, but um, And then just around that time, by absolute pure serendipity, um, one of my friends in medical school I told my then fiance and myself um, about NASA looking for space shuttle astronauts, astronauts for the space shuttle program, and not just pilots, but mission specialists. And we looked over all the requirements, and we had them. The deadline was about a month away. And um, back in those days, of course, you didn't just go online and apply. You had to get the application. You had to get your transcripts. And it took a good month just to get all of that done. So that was June 30th of 1977. And um, a long story about how all that happened, and I won't go into that now. But um, it, about six weeks later, I found I was in the first group of women ever being interviewed. Um, and in, it, interestingly, of that group of 20, um, of the six women that were eventually selected, three of us were in that interview group. So that was just kind of interesting. So anyway, then in 1970, the longest months of my life were those months from August until they announced the selection in January um, of 1978, when I found out I was uh, in the first group of women ever selected for the program. It was. Um, my, my dream, I never even 
you know, that had been my dream since I was 12 years old. And so um, it really wasn't a, a hard decision to make that and to make that change. I, I was very fortunate um, uh, to get us, I got assigned to my flight two weeks before I delivered my daughter. And so I was a new mom training for a space flight all at the same time. Um, quite interesting. I'm happy to talk about that if you're interested. Um, and uh, was very blessed to be on an amazing flight where we brought back two satellites that were put in a, um, their rocket that was supposed to take them to geosynchronous orbit failed four seconds into what should have been a four minute burn and got to be, um, we got to help design all the hardware, the procedures and all of that to bring back these two satellites. Really exciting, really fun um, mission. Uh, was assigned to my second flight shortly after we landed um, and very shortly, I was about six weeks from flight when the Challenger accident happened. My husband and I decided after that we knew that it, we were going to you know, be grounded for a couple of years so we decided to have our second child and Long story short, I wound up taking a seven-year leave of absence to be home with my girls. Um, coming back in 1996 was probably the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life. Um, it was like coming back to a whole new office. Um, when I left, nobody had computers. When I came back, everybody had a computer. Everybody was doing business by email as opposed to meetings. Um, the whole office had changed, new people and everything. So, um, But then... Uh, I was the only person around who had been there at the beginning of the shuttle program. So I was able to have a significant leadership role in the office as we started building and then flying the space station. Um, then I was going to get in line to go fly again. Um, I volunteered to, to be the, the head of the uh, space station branch and said I would do that until we got our first cruise up. So then I was going to get in line and go fly again. and. Um, uh, the Columbia accident happened, so I either have really good timing or really bad timing, but um, I love the space program. I love being a part of exploration, um, getting to talk to young people and encourage them to go into you know, math and science and STEM fields, and so um, I feel very blessed. I, the last thing I worked on, I retired about a year ago, last April, uh, and um, I worked on the uh, display development for the Orion project, so really, not a lot that was medically related, but, it, but I feel like medicine really prepared me for being an astronaut, because medical training was a lot harder, <laughs> to be honest with you. And when you looked at a timeline for the shuttle or the International Space Station, they always give you eight hours of sleep. They actually think you need sleep to do a <laughs> difficult job. And so um, I always felt like I was so well prepared, at least psychologically, even though the material was different um, uh, from my medical training. And about 10 to 15 percent of the office are physicians. The advice I give to young people now who want to join the program and maybe be potential candidates uh, to be on the first mission to Mars is, you know they're going to take at least one doctor, <laughs> and probably two. A geologist, and I would think, this is just my personal opinion, but you know, <laughs> it doesn't take a lot of thought to, to figure that out. And then an IT person. Everybody needs their IT person online. So <laughs> any of you who want to be on a crew uh, to Mars one of these days, and I do think that will happen sometime in the next 20 to 25 years, um, that's something to, to consider. So I feel very blessed to have had an amazing career. Um, but the lesson, I think, is just being prepared. Um, my, all of these things happen serendipitously, just finding out about it. It always bothers me a little bit to look back on my life and to think all these major deci decisions came about almost by luck as opposed to planning. But being prepared uh, for something that comes along and then not being afraid to jump and take advantage of that opportunity. So thanks so much. and. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Wow. <laughs> After Daryl and Anna's story, I think I can stop. Okay. So uh, when I was looking at the uh, program, you know, this uh, topic was supposed to be alter alternate careers. And uh, I think I'm in the wrong place because I had a traditional career, and I just went to the dark side. <laughs> um, so I began my uh, uh, undergraduate work actually just a little bit up, uh, up the street here at Northwestern at the Evanston campus. I uh, did my undergraduate work in chemistry uh, where I really learned um, 
and loved research. I had a great mentor who allowed me to go into the lab the sophomore year. Uh, in the ensuing three years, I, abs I did absolutely nothing, accomplished nothing, except for I learned the process of asking questions. Uh, then I went uh, about five hours south of here. I began my MD-PhD degree, worked at Washington University School of Medicine, had an, a, a second great physician scientist mentor. Uh, I was an immunologist uh, and cell biologist. I finished uh, my MD-PhD at WashU, then continued to do my internal medicine residency and internship at Barnes. Uh, loved the clinical work. Actually, I, I, I was reminded, actually, the, 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 the five-day delirium scenario that was presented by the previous speaker is the same as your internship and residency. <laughs> Every other night on call, you know, et cetera. Then I went to UCSF to do my rheumatology subspecialty training and then went back to the lab and did my postdoc uh, with uh, Art Weiss, another great mentor who really focused on the rigor uh, and depth of the science. And then in a very traditional career, I went back to Wash U uh, and as, a, as an assistant professor and investigator in the, in the Howard Hughes Medical Institute uh, in the departments of medicine, pathology, and immunology, and had a, had a wonderful career there, had phenomenal colleagues, trained a number of really outstanding MD, PhD, PhD, uh, and postdocs, um, and actually uh, was very happy there. Okay, I looked at a number of division chief jobs, decided I didn't want to be an administrator from that aspect. I uh, was very happy, and then one of my friends uh, called me from Genentech and said, uh, what do you think about Genentech? How about coming out to Genentech? I go, what are you? Because I would be the last person that probably went to a biotech or a uh, startup company or a pharma company. In any case, after six months of really agonizing um, soul searching, the ultimate reason why I went to Genentech was in part a frustration I had as an MD, PhD trained physician scientist where I ran my lab, 12 months out of the year. I attended the medicine wards four weeks out of the year. Rheumatology subspecialty six, six weeks out of the year. We would do these great journal clubs in my lab meeting of these phenomenal, interesting scientific vignettes or very interesting scientific observations and said, you know, this would be really cool if we could really translate to this patient because it could really have an impact <coughs> in cardiovascular medicine, Alzheimer's disease, infectious disease, et cetera. And I go back to my lab and say, okay, where's my next, where's the postdoc? I need to talk about their lab, the, the, the progress in their lab. So in essence, it was a leap of faith for me. I really did not know what I was getting myself into. And over the last 17 years at Genentech, I have more, I've used more of my medical training than I ever did when I was at UCSF or at WashU. And the reason why is whenever now, when I read a paper or hear one of the talks over the last two days, I'm always inquiring in my mind, number one, is this important in human disease? And if it is important in human disease, what is the killer experiment that we need to do to know whether that's truth? So invariably, um, I have had great, uh, had a great time so far at Genentech, I have great colleagues, and I actually am truly living what the goal of an MD-PhD program is, which is to be able to enable the translation of science into medicines that truly impact patients. Uh, it's not for everyone. It's very depressing because most of the time we fail. But as, again, in the previous uh, uh, talk, you always have to get up. Hopefully you've learned something about the complexities of human biology and you have to go and um, rethink your scientific paradigms of how human disease operates and give it a second try. Thank you so much. So if you have any questions, please stop to the middle of the room, to that microphone over there, introduce yourself with your name, institution, and then your question. Um, but just to transition us a little bit, I have a couple questions for our panelists. So the first one is addressed to you, Dr. Dykes. So um, because dual degree program funding by the NIH emphasizes academia as the gold standard career path, how can we overcome these preferences to pursue careers outside of academia? <coughs> 
Uh, it's, it's a really interesting and tough question. I, I don't know what it's going to take to kind of overcome those um, traditional ideas about, you know, where MD, PhD uh, folks are, are best positioned kind of on, in our ecosystem. Uh, but I can tell you for sure, my own experience, um, I actually, uh, a couple years ago, uh, 2015, went back to my alma mater at Syracuse uh, to receive a Distinguished Alumnus Award from the MD-PhD program. And I had a very interesting conversation with the, the current chair of that program um, about what's essentially my, my failure uh, as a medical scientist because I was not doing bench research. And um, I thought a lot about that. It kind of struck me, uh, struck me hard. And as I look back now, and kind of one of the things that, that I think I'll, I'll share with you, um, if I look at the things that I have accomplished over the past, say, two years, for instance, using my medical degree and my, my graduate degree, my graduate training in very untraditional ways, uh, I'm happy that they have had very significant impacts, I think, on delivery of science and healthcare and, and actually the, the, the fundamental goals of these kinds of training. I'll give you one, uh, one example. In uh, 2016, so at the end of the Obama administration, uh, I was serving on the uh, House Energy and Commerce Committee when we passed the 21st Century Cures Act. And I don't know if, if many of you are familiar with that, but it was a piece of legislation that actually reauthorized the NIH budget uh, for two years, authorized about uh, $6.4 billion in new funds uh, with major emphasis on translational research, on uh, emerging uh, scientists. So part of this bill was specifically aimed at uh, getting more money to folks like you who are, who are new and upcoming uh, scientists, uh, struggling with the traditional R01 uh, challenges that, that we've heard about. And one of the things that became very clear to me in that experience is, as you can imagine, when you're talking about major government agencies and the political divide that was very, very rampant at that, at that time and continues, there was a lot of lobbying. There was a lot of uh, bipartisan bickering and fighting that was going on. Uh, all the drug companies had their lobbyists there uh, lobbying for, for their interests. But notably absent was us, right? So uh, scientists and physicians tend not to show up and uh, voice their concerns or lobby for their needs in those, in those environments. So long, long story short, I, I think um, there's not only a place f outside of traditional academic and, and medical roles, but there's a, there's a phenomenal need. And I can tell you that I'm, I'm very happy that um, my voice was received. Um, and on these committees, I, I have multiple examples where individual pieces of legislation were being considered or were going to the floor, going to the White House. And I was in meetings and was able to bring the voice of the physician and the scientist to those meetings and was, and was surprised to some degree that I was listened to in ways that fundamentally and critically shaped uh, the delivery of science and medicine, including NIH budgets. Thank you. All right. Hi, I'm Stephen Schur from uh, The Ohio State University, MSTP. Um, thank you all for speaking. And uh, Dr. Dykes, you made an interesting comment that when you went back to your MSTP, you had a um, discussion about the choices you had made in your career. And Dr. Chan, you had said that you feel more like a physician scientist outside of academic medicine than within. How do we convince our mentors and our colleagues that these alternative choices are legitimate and aren't sort of betrayal to the cause of academic medicine, but are more sort of embracing alternative paths to truth and science? So I think um, I have a very simple, naive answer to that. You have to live your own life, okay? You can't model yourself um, to somebody else's life. I think even with the speakers here, 
we're just providing you our own stories. And what we can provide you is, in our paths, these are the things that went well, and these are the pitfalls. And you should watch these pitfalls, not that necessarily they'll happen to you, uh, but you should be cognizant of them. So I think in each of our own careers, you know, when I made the transition, I called up like 30 plus people who were in academia, in industry, who had made transitions, and I listened to all of them. Okay, and um, in the end, you, it's just a gut feel as to what you want to do. You can't fear, and you have to buy either probably at first as as a process of elimination. You know what you don't want to you want what you don't want to do. But in the end, each of the, our paths, as well as all of your paths, you're going to charter by yourself. Um, so I don't view that whether others view you as a success or a failure or other, anything in between uh, should be a serious consideration when you yourself are figuring out your own career paths. Thank you. Hi, I'm Alan Blaney from uh, Syracuse, New York, SUNY Upstate. Uh, I apologize for the um, hometown hero welcome. We, we don't get to see our alumni <laughs> Uh, in places like this that often. It's pretty incredible. Um, and listening to all of you is really incredible to hear you tell your stories. Um, it's very inspiring for me personally. I'm, I'm trained as a chemist. Um, before I started, um, before I had my personal crisis and I said, I, I go, geez, I need to go do something with people um, and took on medicine. Then, then I ended up in Syracuse, New York, <laughs> studying biophysics. Um, and I come to a conference like this and I have yet another crisis where I look at what I'm doing and look what everyone's doing and I look at the ways that um, my involvement with a free clinic sometimes means so much more to me than the biophysics that I'm doing um, and trying to figure out where my impact is going to be uh, and so it's, it's great to see that all of you have gone through so many of these different steps and just shifted in such radical ways it's incredibly motivating uh, and I promise I'm getting to a question <laughs> Um, which is that I'm, I'm curious how you look back on your specific graduate work. You know, I'm doing biophysics now, as you did, Dr. Dykes. Um, y you now you know, work with um, the White House and the Capitol, and that's a huge jump. And I wonder how you look back on the, the value of your graduate years. Um, and th I guess the same thing to the others, the research training that you did uh, how does that relate out to, you know, we talked about how medicine relates out, but how does that relate out to all the other incredible things that you've done? Yeah, I think that's a very um, uh, astute observation and interesting question. And what I'll tell you is that uh, the basic science work that I was doing, like all of you were doing at the time, was absolutely cutting edge at the time. And it did not take long for me to get away from my own, you know, line of research for me to be like a dinosaur, kind of specifically with respect to the things that I'm doing. What it did, however, and, and what I'll, I'll forever um, cherish about, about that training is it's more about the process and it's about the ability to uh, look at a problem like a scientist and to design a hypothesis like a scientist and to test that hypothesis and to communicate like a scientist. And uh, as I look at the, every single one of the non-traditional roles that I've had, whether it's being a physician manager or a business person or you know, a, a congressional advisor, uh, there are two things that I think directly resulted from that. Number one was credibility. And then the other, the other is uh, the ability to communicate, to be bilingual. And so I can't tell you how many times I've sat with scientists who are lobbyists or drug company executives, and all and instantly in the room, um, I had credibility with them because of this, this training. And it broke down barriers. It allowed for communications. It allowed for negotiation. And then also the ability to uh, translate. So when these guys come in and they're talking about their wonderful uh, drugs and devices and, and so forth, and I've got 
you know, congressmen and, and uh, White House staff on the other side, being that person who's the intermediary who can actually translate these things because they know was hugely beneficial. And so I don't, I, I don't think it was a loss at all. I think it, that really enhanced my ability to do the things that I'm, I've done. Um, the one aspect I would add to it is that um, independent of how you get there, I think the one very important training that you have to derive is mastery of problem solving. Okay? That's what a PhD is about. Okay? You're trying to identify really, really important questions. That's number one. Number two is, can you solve those problems definitively? Because there are lots of great problems to solve. But if you require you know, breaking one of the laws of physics, it's not going to happen. All right? um, and then once you're able to master problem solving, that's going to deep. All right? You have to learn how to go deep. Then you can go broad. Right? But you can't go broad without knowing how to go deep. And in fact, that's what clinical medicine is about. Clinical medicine is, you know, in the emergency room, chest pain. Well, you know, you go through your differential diagnosis. There's a time element because you don't get to, re you know, if you screw up your experiment, you don't get to just thaw out another patient and try again, <laughs> right? Um, so there's a time element. You figure out, okay, what are the most life-threatening things that's going to kill this patient in the next 30 seconds that I don't do the right, you know, don't uh, intervene immediately. But it's just problem solving. So having the depth of knowledge to be able to go deep allows you then to apply that skill set to anywhere else, any other problem, because you understand what the critical questions are, what the hypotheses are, what the outcomes are. And just to wrap it up, you know, the way I look, and drug discovery is a little different, in that the way I look at it is, that, you know, I tell the uh, grad students the following, okay, science and nature, there are only four figures, okay, unless you have an article, there are only four figures, all right? And there's only one figure in that entire paper that makes it a science and nature paper. I want that figure first. You get me that figure four, I'll give you all the resources to do the other three figures and the 85 supplemental figures. Okay? <laughs> but I don't want the, you know, figure one, yeah, 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 still hadn't proven it. I want to understand what's that experiment that really tips the balance of likelihood of success. Okay, so I think that's part of just good problem solving. You understand what the problem is, you immediately envision what all the possible uh, uh, ways by which you can attack the problem, whether it be a, be a patient or a scientific problem or a legal issue. Legal issue, the politics are a little different. Um, same, you know, you're in space, you know, you have a particular uh, 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 situation that arises, it's problem solving. So I think in, in ver invariably, in all your training, the most important thing isn't the wet bench skill set that you're trying to develop. That you're going to buy in a kit in a couple years. Robots will be doing those. Okay? It's the actual thinking and how do you ask the right questions and how do you address those questions. And I agree with everything that you all have said, but the one thing I would add also is looking back on my progression, um, the, the things, the, the work I did in, in research and chemistry, um, and then becoming a physician and all of that added to my confidence. At the very beginning, when I went into the, when I got that un, un, undergraduate research fellowship, I didn't really in my own head think that I was good enough to do that kind of research. And I found out that I was. And I was able to come up with ideas that contributed to our group and uh, doing new things. Then when I went to medical school, the same thing. You're constantly comparing yourself to other people and, um, and thinking, I'm not that good. And then um, suddenly you become a physician, you're in charge in an emergency room, you're doing surgeries, and all of a sudden you look back and you go, wow, I guess I do have what it takes. And all of that helped me when I finally went to NASA um, be comfortable when I'm again in a totally unfamiliar situation. I had the confidence from doing research at UCLA and then uh, becoming a physician and all of that um, contributed to my knowing that yes, I may not know exactly how to be an astronaut yet, but I will learn and I will be good at it. So.
thank you all so much for your insights. And I guess I'll be able to keep this in mind next time I worry about disappointing Dr. Pearl. No. <laughs> thank you. My name is Michelle Corcoran from the University of Minnesota. And I'm really curious about industry dynamics, specifically scientific freedom. And I was wondering if you could compare and contrast your freedom to design experiments and ex execute them fully um, in the academia setting versus the industry setting. Um, of course, you know, in the academic setting, um, you have total freedom, right? As long as you can get funded, but you have total freedom. <laughs> I used to uh, rile up my, my lab because I, you know, graduate students come in. We're in an immunology lab. And I always, once in a while, go, you know, maybe we should work on flies next week. We just stop everything that we're doing. We're going to work on flies. And I could have done that. Right? You have total academic freedom. And that's the beauty of academia. If you really want to pursue a critical, important scientific problem that you're interested in, you have total freedom to be able to do that. In the context of Biopharma, uh, the world is different. Okay, you will have very specific goals. Um, by and large, for most moderate to large size companies, uh, there is still a very important aspect of doing the critical experiment because you want to know as early as possible that a particular therapeutic hypothesis is wrong. It would not succeed because every phase thereafter costs substantially more, right? We might spend X amount in research, but it's like 10X into a phase one, 30X into a phase two, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very important to be able to, uh, to fail early. So I think uh, in industry, while at Genentech, we have the luxury of actually spending a substantial amount of research dollars on just doing basic science research. You know, we have a postdoc program with 140 postdocs. We spend about 20% of our research budget on just basic biology. We publish. Um, but in the translational and the pipeline aspects, they're much more directed. All right? What's your therapeutic hypothesis? What's the experiment to know whether that's going to be doable or not? Do you have all the reagents that are there? So it's a more focused aspect of, um, of science. Do you think that um, being in academia and then transitioning to industry kind of gives you more scientific freedom, or did it help at all? Um, I think, again, it comes back to what I, I view, it's my, the w way I look at it. It's a matter of whether you are uh, well suited to do deep, mastered, masterful science. Okay. In the end, it's just the experience that counts. When you see, you know, I, my advice to everybody is that uh, whether you're in academia or in industry, is that you really have to read broadly. The biological systems, whether it's in plants, in yeast, in worms, in humans, are by and large conserved. The rheostats are different, okay? So if you understand broadly how the scientific and biological pathways work, you can make important insights in human biology and human health. And if you have that breadth and apply it to human biology, you will make startling discoveries. And su a subset of that will be translatable into therapeutics. Thank you. All right, we have room for two more questions. And then I'll let the speakers wrap up with any last minute um, guiding principles that they would like to give us. Thanks. Um, my name is Joe, so I'm from Rutgers. Um, this is uh, some of a follow-up to the prior question, um, which is essentially my question. But I was wondering, um, transitioning from academia to Genentech, um, what, was it hard? Was there a cultural difference? I mean, you said you were going to the dark side, and there's a reputation that uh, corporations put profitability over innovation. Um, and I was wondering, in terms of, this cultural transition, well, A, does it exist? I mean, is it really that bad? And B, um, how did you manage it? Um, so the dark side really was as a black box, OK? Uh, at, at Genentech, I think we might be a little bit different in that we, as I just noted before, you know, spent a lot of time just doing basic bio biological research. I mean, just for example, in my, in my daily life, all right, I have a lab. 
It's not as large as it used to be at Wash U. It's five people, three postdocs, two staff folks. Uh, I have lab meeting every week with them. Uh, I meet with them just like I did with, with, at Wash U uh, with the postdocs every, every other week. We go over work, we go over science. When we're getting cl close to the papers, they know I pester them every five minutes of wh where the next figure is. Um, so I think at Genentech, we are fortunate to have sort of an intermediary aspect. All right, now, um, learning the drug discovery business is very challenging. All right, fortunately, I have a chemistry background, but even with a chemistry background, the rules and what ha one has to learn of how to make a, 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 a very potent, specific, and selective small molecule to hit the target is a different world, right? Um, and one has to, there's a huge learning curve. Um, but the good thing is that when folks make these transitions, people aren't going to throw you into, you know, hot water. Uh, because if they hire you, they want you to succeed. You have to succeed, right? Because if you don't succeed, the company doesn't succeed. So the company's goal is to do everything possible to ensure that you succeed. And so there's usually a learning curve, there's usually a, a gating process by, you know, you will learn different things at different times. Uh, and once you master those things, then I think um, you're in a really, really terrific place. Thank you. Um, hello, uh, my name is Aaron Sandoval. I'm a sophomore undergraduate from the University of Florida. Uh, my question is for Dr. Fisher, actually. Um, so you were talking about how you made these big life-changing decisions like switching off of the PhD track and onto the MD track or going towards uh, space instead of medicine or like uh, clinical medicine rather. Um, so what kind of considerations did you make to make these huge life-changing decisions and do you ever have any regrets about the, ch the choices you made? Each of those decisions were not really very hard for me because in the back of my mind I had this goal. I had always wanted to be an astronaut. And um, as I kind of alluded, as I went through my decision making, although at the time I was making decisions I didn't um, know how to plan to that, um, I still had that basic goal that was driving everything. So when I found out very for, um, by, by pure chance that NASA was looking for astronauts, um, I made that decision in a heartbeat. I mean, it was not um, a, a difficult decision for me. Um, do I have regrets? Oh, definitely. I mean, I love practicing medicine. Um, I love chemistry. Um, I wish that, that you could have, you know, several lifetimes to do all these different careers because, um, but it's just, you know, not possible to practice medicine and try to be an astronaut at the same time. I actually tried my first year. I continued to work in emergency rooms, but it just became, um, you know, too difficult to try to do that, and plus with a medical malpractice and, and all those sorts of issues, um, they're just e equally demanding careers. So, but yeah, there's always, you know, when my mom was getting ill and I was spending a lot of time in the hospital and I saw everybody running around in their white coats and everything, yes, I felt, you know, oh, a little bit of regret that I couldn't do that. But um, in the long run, you know, I, I look back on everything and I wouldn't change any decision that I, that I made. Thank, Thank you so much. All right, so I'm going to let our speakers give us some last remarks, starting with you, Dr. Dykes. Sure. You know, one of the benefits of being on panels with really smart people like this uh, to my left is you learn something uh, from this and, and what I heard from uh, my friends here today were three words that I, I think all of you should focus on in my opinion. Uh, number one was serendipity, the other was mentors and the other is leap of faith and those, those kinds of words kind of sum up my experience uh, precisely. There is no way in the world, as an MD-PhD student 25 or more years ago, um, I would have ever predicted that I would have taken the career pathway uh, that I did. And so much of it had to do with just very, very chance and unpredictable and almost unfathomable uh, experiences uh, that opened up doors. 
And many of those doors, uh, to, to the second word, mentors, had to do with uh, engaging with and meeting with and being inspired by really incredible people who uh, were doing novel things and interesting things and, and exciting things and sort of ignited or catalyzed uh, my interest in kind of doing those things. But then it does require leaps of faith to uh, sort of go down some of these pathways that seem um, non-traditional or risky. Uh, I can't tell you uh, how I felt after having been in clinical practice and the, the manager of a big group for a decade. Uh, I was like Rodney Dangerfield when I went back to law school and was there with you know 21 year old law students again and kind of doing that whole thing. So it really does require uh, leaps of faith. But by and large, what I would say is I have not regretted a minute of it. It's been an absolutely uh, wonderful and fantastic ride. I think I've got a whole lot more to do. So hopefully I'll be invited back to this panel in about 10 years, and I'll have a whole different story. Um, but uh, yeah, I wish you all uh, success. And uh, I also wanted to reach out and tell you that um, if I can help and, or answer questions or inspire any of you in any ways, feel free to reach out and, and I always uh, love engaging and, and doing these kinds of things. All right, so unfortunately I've been instructed that we have to move on now. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, the speakers will be here for a little bit while afterwards. Um, but thank you again everyone for coming and thank you so much for our speakers. Let's give them a round of applause.